we've gathered to discuss practical steps towards Imam Sahib al and, and I'm emphasizing on the word towards. Whenever we embark on any particular journey to go towards a particular destination, for example, if I'm in London and I go from London to Manchester, or if you're in Pakistan, you go from, for example, Karachi to Islamabad. And there must be some specific reason for you to embark on that particular journey. If you're heading towards Islamabad and you don't know why you're going to Islamabad, then it's not going to have, the journey won't have much meaning towards you. Nor are you going to put much effort in that journey to reach that particular destination. You need to know why you're going to that particular destination. So when we gather to discuss practical steps towards Imam Sahib al-Asr, we need to know why we're going towards Imam Sahib al-Asr. What's the reason? So when I tried to, you know, think about how, what people would say, I noted down a few reasons and uh, I just want to share them with you before we go on, go on to the actual uh, steps um, on the individual level. Some people might start saying that he's the Imam of our time and hence we must get closer to him. Getting closer to him means getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And distance from him means distance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he's the Imam of our time. And to emphasize on this point, I just want to give the example of the 8th of the Hijjah when Imam Hussein alayhi salam had to abandon his Hajj in Mecca. He had to remove his Ihram because of his Madhrumiyya and people knew that he's being persecuted and hence he's leaving as a result of this persecution. The scholars are unanimous in saying that whoever saw Imam Hussein alayhi salam in Mecca leaving whilst knowing whilst why he's leaving with his family that he's being persecuted, he's being oppressed and he's leaving as a result but they still went to Hajj and they didn't go with Imam Hussein alayhi salam. The scholars are unanimous in saying that that year their Hajj was void, it didn't have any validity. This is the result of going towards acts of ibadah that we think are, are ibadah, but without the imam of our time. And hence, we need to go wherever the imam of our time is. In their time, the imam of their time was Imam Hussein al-Islam. They had to go wherever Imam Hussein al-Islam went, but they didn't do that. And hence, closeness to the imam of your time, in our time is Imam Sahih al-Islam, the one, means closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And distance from him means distance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second reason is that he's the maximum manifestation of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And hence, he's the biggest sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ayatullah al-Kubra, the way we say. Ayatullah al-Akbar, the greatest sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the Imam of time. And hence, we must get closer to this maximum manifestation of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third reason is that the mission of all the prophets and the Imams rests on his shoulders, the Imam of our time. But he's going to be the one who's going to be establishing this whole earth with fairness and equity and justice, the way it's currently been established with boom and joy and you know oppression. So this is the main purpose of all the prophets who have come before, all the imams who have come, the 11 imams who have come before, all of them wanted to establish this government of justice. And this will be finally achieved when Imam Sahib and Asli Wasaman comes. And hence, we need to align ourselves with all of the goals of the prophets of Islam, for the old of the prophets that came in the past and all of the imams who were there. And when we align ourselves with this goal, we naturally align ourselves with the imam of time. Number four, many people give this reason that dying without his ma'arifa would be like dying the death of jahiliyah. Whoever dies without recognizing the imam of their time, without knowing the word ya'alim is not used, ya'arif is used, without recognizing, there's a difference between knowing and recognizing. Whoever dies without recognizing the Imam of their time, they've died a death of Jahili. And hence, recognizing the Imam of our time necessitates getting closer to him. And hence, we've gathered on this on this night, on this Friday night, to discuss ways to get closer to the Imam of our time. So inshallah, we'll begin the steps. And I've got um, five specific steps that I thought would be relevant for youths in today's time. There are many, many steps. There's a whole book, for example, the last, the last luminary and ways to delve into the, the, the light, something uh, uh, along that title. It discusses 99 or 100 steps to get closer to the Imam of our time. But what other, other ulama of akhlaq have said, using those things and gathering those particular things, there are specific things which our youths today need to know <clears throat> on an individual level and on a social level, which are more ap applicable to them today, for example, ourselves today, um, than any other time. The first specific step that we need to take into account when we get closer to the Imam, when we 
discuss getting closer to the Imam with our time. The first step is not to upset the Imam. And nothing upsets the Imam more than us committing sins. And especially in today's society, committing sins is much, much more easier. With the advancements, advancement of technology, social media, committing sins, backbiting, lying, uh, doing other stuff becomes much, much more easier. And the very biggest thing that upsets the Imam is us committing sins. A person comes to Imam Sadi salam, and the Imam looks at him and he says, why have you heard the Prophet of God? The man looks at him in the hadith and he says that I have even met the Prophet of God. No, as my father, no, as my grandfather. How can I upset the Prophet of God? So the Imam looks at him and he says that on this particular day, at this particular time, when you committed that sin, you've heard the Prophet of God. Because the Imam, the Hujjatullah, sees, he hears. And this is the most important thing that the Imam sees when we commit sins, he knows, he understands. And then that upsets him because he says, look, people are still committing sins intentionally. How can they be preparing for my reappearance? So nothing upsets the Imam more than his committing. A person came to Ayatul Abbasid and he said that, oh, I'm going to Isfahan, give me a dhikr. And this is available on YouTube as well. You can see this on the video. So many people will come to Ayatul Abbasid and ask him for adhikar. So he looks at the man and he says, whether you're going to Isfahan or Mazam Daram or Khurasan, it doesn't make a difference. The Bala Tareen Dhikr, the maxim, the highest Dhikr is that which I'm about to tell you. And that is this, that to make a niya, strong intention, strong irada, that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives me a lifetime of a hundred years, I won't even once commit a sin intentionally and knowingly. I won't disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the maximum, this is the Bala Tareen Dhikr. And this is a continuous thing. And you only need to go 40 days. Uh, the hadith says, Man sabahan, min Whoever sincerely devotes himself for 40 days to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it says 40 mornings, but 40 days, meaning your actions and your intentions are purely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and slowly, slowly, it's not going to be like you're going to be on, like the way you're on for day 40 on day one. It's a gradual process. You don't overburden yourself. But to purify yourself by making your intentions and your actions for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what's going to happen for 40 days? Fountains of wisdom will gush out from your chest to your tongue, meaning it's going to, your potential is going to be unlocked. So just not committing sins is extremely, extremely important. You can go, because the Imam says that whether you don't even do that many wajibat, but as long as you don't commit any sins, the foundation of your building will be extremely strong. But once you start committing sins, you're shaking the whole foundation. Whatever you're going to build on that, it's not going to be of any value. So the number one step is not to upset the Imam. And what upsets the Imam? Us committing sins. There's a very good example given by the ulama. They say that in a particular city, there was a sheikh and there were many people and the people came in that city, they would take out, in the olden times, they would take out their water from a well, you know, the well, um, the way we say in Udu Akua. Uh, so uh, they would go and they would take out their water from the well. And a person comes, to, the people come to the sheikh and they say to the sheikh that a dog has fallen into the well. What do we do? The sheikh went to them and he said that, you know, you take out 40 bu buckets of water and inshallah the water will become tahir again, will become pak. So they go and do that, they remove the 40 buckets of water, whatever, and uh, they come, the sheikh asks for a glass of water. They bring a glass of water from the well, and as the sheikh is about to drink this, he sees that there's a, a hair of a dog in there. He's confused. He says that, didn't you guys take out the 40 buckets of water? He says, yeah, we did. So he says, where is this hair coming from? It should have all been removed. He's thinking, he's thinking, he's thinking, and then he says that you've removed the 40 buckets of water, but have you removed the dog itself? They say, no, we left the dog inside. He says, this is the whole problem. How can you leave it first? You remove the dog and then you purify the water. First, we need to remove all the vices from our hearts. And then we add, when whatever we do in terms of self-purification, ibadat, ita'a, everything will be of value. But as long as these vices and these sins are in your heart, the foundation, the building that you're building, uh, it's not going to be of much value. So the very first thing is to stop sinning as much as you can, purify yourself, by not contaminating yourself. Um, there's a hadith that I found particularly interesting. A person comes to Imam Ali alayhi salam, and this is in Al-Kafi. Um, and he says to the Imam, Inni harimtu salata billay. He says to the Imam that I've been deprived of the opportunity to pray the night salatul lay. Not often people try and try and try, but they just can't do it. 
So the Imam looks at him and he says, Ant rajulun qayyid, qad qayyidat kabunub. This answer was specific to that particular person, which the Imam's thought of waking him up. This is the best way to wake him up, this particular person. So the Imam tells him that Ant rajulun qad qayyidat kabunub. You're an individual, you're a person whose sins have imprisoned you. Your sins have imprisoned you, and as a result, you're not able to carry out this particular act, act, act of goodness. But the important thing is this, that the Imam uses a word called qayd, qayyadatka, that word comes from the word qayd, and we have a similar word in Urdu, uh, qayd, you know, being imprisoned. So why does the Imam use the word qayd? In Arabic, qayd, the root word, the actual meaning of qayd means to shackle a person's legs. When you shackle a person's legs, they can't move forward. That disables them from moving forward. This is the word of, this is the meaning of qayd. So when the Imam says, your sins have imprisoned you, meaning what? Your sins have shackled you. They have shackled your spiritual legs. When you've committed all of these sins, you've put shackles on your legs and hence you can't move forward on this spiritual path. You can't go forward because you're committing sins. You need to wipe yourself off from these sins and then everything else becomes easier. Person, then Imam Ali also says in, you know, Imam Sadr says in, إِلَّا الشَّرَائِ he says that in the Rajulun Layakib al Kadiba for Yuhramu Biha Salatul Lay. Indeed, a man just says a lie during the day, and as a result, he's deprived of the Salatul Lay. He's deprived of the night prayer. So sins have an you know knock-on effect. And you know, being you know purified of the sin after being doing istighfar, being forgiven of the sin is, is easy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive if you're sincere and you don't repeat the sin again, and you're sincere in your istighfar. But wiping out the effects of that sin is a different story altogether. It takes time to wipe out. It's possible, but it takes time. It's not as quickly as the sin being completely forgiven. But that can also happen. So that's the first thing. We need to uh, not upset the imam by committing sins. The second step, and inshallah, if you want, you can make notes of this because it might be easy to forget. The second step is to raise our level of tawheed. And this is specific. We must understand one big fact that we seem to be heedless of individually and on a social level. We seem we seem to be heedless of the fact that the duhur of the Imam, the reappearance of the Imam is just a higher manifestation of Tawheed. After that, the Raj'ah is a higher manifestation and Yawm Al-Qiyamah is all Tawheed. When, when you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the cause of all causes, Musabdib al you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the cause of all causes. When you do this individually, Allah! when you do this, if you just put that person inside and that'd be great. Um, when, you see, when you do this before the reappearance, when you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as musabdibul isbab, the cause of all causes, you've linked yourself with the reality of the duhur, which is a higher manifestation of tawheed. You become a muwahid. This is the main purpose of the Dhuhr. When you naturally increase your level of Tawheed, you're getting, your you're getting yourself closer to the reality of the Dhuhr. And hence, you get closer to the Imam of your time. You understand and realize that the grocer is not the sustainer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al -Razib. You understand and you realize that the, that the car alarm is not the preserver. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is al hafil Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places uh, preservation in that car alarm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows that individual who is the grocer to be the sustainer. And it's not that you don't thank that person. Whoever doesn't thank the hadith says, whoever doesn't thank people hasn't thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning you appreciate the asbab that are coming, but you, you realize and you understand that musabibul asbab is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The tablet is not the cure. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a shafi. Ya man yaj'adu shifa'a fi ma yasha'u min al ashia. Who, oh, he who places cure in the things that he himself wishes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed shifa in that tablet that you're taking. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a shafi. You realize and you understand that musabibul asbab is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You realize and you understand that you're just a safekeeper. And any sort of goodness that you have is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what alhamdulillah means. All perfection is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what subhanallah means. All imperfection is free. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is free from all imperfection. I'm full of all 
uh, all, I'm full of all imperfection. I'm empty of any goodness. If I have any sort of goodness, if I have, for example, the attribute of generosity, I know it's coming from Al Jawad. If I have so, some sort of ill, I know that it's coming from Al Ali. Well, you you're just a safekeeper. All goodness is from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So the Imam, and this can only happen when you develop your soul according to the teachings of the faith of the Quran. And the Imam wants a generation of Muwahideen. He wants individuals who are pure in their Tawheed, not, uh, 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 you, know, uh, you know, contaminated with the multiplicities of this world. Imam wants individuals who are Muwahideen, and these are the individuals who will be helping the Imam. And hence, we need the second step is that we must raise our level of Tawheed. Number three is to increase your knowledge. And we know that uh, this is the third step, and we know that knowledge is of two types. There's ilm al-husuli and there's ilm al-husuli. Ilm al-husuli is uh, ilm, knowledge that you gain through your senses, your eyes, your ears. And many of the knowledge, much of the knowledge that we gain today is from our senses. But the sad reality is that we just stop at that. There's a second type of knowledge, which is ilm al-husuli, which is knowledge by presence, knowledge, knowledge by Exist, existence, existential knowledge, presential knowledge, uh, that in the, uh, a knowledge that you can taste. But ilm al-husuli is a preliminary to ilm al-husuli, but we don't we don't just stop at that. How do we get to ilm al-husuli? We'll just explain now. But just to quickly understand, you know what what I'm going to refer to here is uh, you know sometimes stories can be very quickly to easier and you know helpful in understanding what I'm trying to say. Um, one of the students of Azad al just says that one day I was walking um, with him from his house to the mosque where he used to lead prayers. And many people would say that, you know, many people would gather around Azad al waiting for him outside his house to go towards the mosque together. Um, and he would be, you know, with his dhikr and whenever someone would come to ask a question, he would pause his dhikr and answer the question. So this time he himself turns towards this particular student and he says to him that, a student comes into the Hawza and he starts with the Muqaddamat and then he goes to the Ma'alim and then he goes to the Mughni different stages. Where does he go after that? He asks the student, Ayat al-Bashir asks the student. So the student says to him that he goes to uh, uh, Numa'ah, he goes to a, another another book. And then Ayat al-Bashir says, where does he go after that? He says he goes to Makasib, which is a book in Fiqh. And then he says, where does he go after that? He goes to Kifaya. And then where does he go after that? He, the student says he goes to Dars al-Kharij. We bought her the al -Kharij. And then where does he go after that? The student says that he goes to Ishtihad. He attains Ishtihad. I think he's reached the top of the house. Uh, he's attained Ishtihad. And we know when people attain Ishtihad nowadays, they call them they call them Ayatullah, which is the highest stage of uh, the house. But Ayat al he thought that Ayat al would stop there. Then Ayat al says to him, then what? What's after ijtihad? So the student says that at that point, I realized that if ilm is not gained with more proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's useless. The end goal is proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you're gaining knowledge, whether it's fiqh or akhlaq or tariq or any sort of knowledge, if it's not done with proximity, with the knee of proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because that's the end goal, that's the end goal, it's not going to be of much use. So slowly, slowly, your, your, the end that you're gaining as well, has to be purely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when it becomes purely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's barakah in that ilm. It will benefit you. So ilm, that's ilm al-husuli, all when you're getting through your senses. Now ilm al-husuli is presential knowledge, a knowledge that you can taste, feel, and understand, not just memorize. Now how do you get to ilm al-husuli? This is extremely important. Imam Khomeini has a very important quote that I put down on my notes here that I really wanted to mention this word by word. Imam Khomeini says that Imam Khomeini would emphasize a lot when you gain knowledge, when you gain knowledge, it has to be matched with self purification. Every step of knowledge has to be matched with a step in self purification. He says that if you wish to train your soul, then you won't be able to discipline it through ilm alone. You can't discipline your soul through ilm alone. Knowledge does not discipline man, he says. Sometimes knowledge leads man to the hellfire. Sometimes the knowledge of Tawheed leads a man to the hellfire. Sometimes the knowledge of Irfan leads a man to the hellfire. Sometimes the knowledge of Fiqh leads a man to the hellfire. Sometimes the knowledge of Akhlaq 
leads the man to a hellfire. Knowledge alone does not reform or refine man. It says man must do tesky, purification of the soul. Or you say key him. This is the most important uh, role of the Holy Prophet, which is mentioned in the Holy Quran. He purifies the souls. When he says purification comes before all other matters. Now, when you gain purification of the soul, naturally that leads to taqwa. When you gain knowledge and you purify your soul, it leads to taqwa, true taqwa. And after taqwa, what happens? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches. The Quran says, What taqwa wa yu'allimukum Allah. Have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah himself will teach you. Now, this type of knowledge is not ilm husuli, it's ilm husuli. It's presential knowledge. It's knowledge that he can taste. Sometimes you see individuals, they haven't been to any sort of, you know, house or anything like that. Although going to house is extremely, extremely important. But the normal people living normal lives, but they see, they're speaking words of wisdom. What type of knowledge is this? They're speaking words which enter into the heart. They find a place in the hearts. How does this work? Allah, if this comes from taqwa, slowly, slowly, and Allah himself teaches you through different things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises when you take your head up a little bit and you realize and you have taqwa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises that we would definitely, definitely show them the signs, ayatina, our signs in the horizons and within their own souls. What happens after seeing these signs? Until it becomes clear to them, not that until they know or they understand until it becomes clear for them, until it becomes absolutely clear for them. What becomes clear? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the ultimate truth. This can only happen through taqwa. This can only happen through taqwa and which leads to ilm al That was step number three. And step number four is adopting correct role models. This is extremely, extremely important. One of the main reasons that I believe that our youths are stagnating in today's time is because we haven't adopted correct role models. If we have adopted correct, if we have adopted role models, then we've adopted individuals who have a lot of materialistic success, who have made a lot of wealth. Individuals like, what's his name, Elon Musk or uh, Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates or people like that, who have a lot of materialistic wealth. What we're not realizing or what we're not thinking about is the question, where will this individual be after 100 years and where will his wealth be after 100 years? They, will, they both will be separated. So why am I basing someone as my role model? Or why am I establishing someone as my role model based on something which is funny, which is, you know, uh, which is going to finish? These individuals are going to be separated from their wealth. It's not going to, it's not going to last forever. It's funny. It's not powerful. Why am I basing, why am I establishing someone as my role model based on something which is funny? which is transient, it makes us realize that we must base our role models on something which is baqi, something which is linked with al-baqi, with the everlasting. Who should we establish our, as our role models? Someone who's spiritually dead or someone who's spiritually alive? Who does the Quran, the Quran, you know, multiple on multiple occasions says that these individuals, they're not truly alive. But one particular group that the Quran says these individuals are truly, truly alive. They're not dead. Do not even think, do not even think the Imam Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Don't even think. He says, don't, he's not saying don't even say, he's saying don't even think that those individuals killed in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are dead. They're not dead. They're truly alive. They're receiving their sustenance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't even think the shuhada, those individuals who are killed in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether it's the shuhada of the early days of Islam, after the Holy Prophet, or whether it's the recent shuhada. And slowly, slowly, we need to start unraveling their biographies and understanding more about them. Simple examples are the, for example, in the recent times, that there's a book come up on Shaykh Ibn Hadi. Many of you already probably read that book. Books like they, these, for example, the book on Shaykh Muhsin Hujaji with his head held high. That book has just been released now as well. It's a brilliant book. I've read it myself as well. It's an absolutely brilliant book. A, a Shaheed who went to fight against ISIS and was martyred in 2017, 2016, or 2017. Individuals 
of our time. These individuals were so recent that they used to run telegram channels. Or Sanjiti had a telegram channel. He was that recent. That's the point. But individuals like in our time are role models. No one's saying to go and do what they, they perform their duty. We need to perform our duty. But we need to take these individuals as role models. And hence, we will be able to understand and achieve this high level of life that they achieved. Um, so as adopting correct role models, whether it's the ulama, or whether it's uh, the fuqaha, or whether it's the shuhada, these individuals whose success is based on something which is baqi, which is everlasting, because they're connected with al-baqi, is going to be a cause of our success as well. That is number four. And number five, the step number five is tawajjuh and tawassul towards the end. This is something which is so neglected nowadays. There are some individuals who spend their whole life, 10, 15, 20, 30 years, establishing it. Should we do tawassul? Should we not do tawassul? Oh, let's establish all the academic proofs and all the... Baba, you're missing the point. You're wasting your life. Just pick the side. After a little bit of research, understand. Ask the correct ulama and understand what, what the whole story is about. Missing out, you're not even doing the act. So once we once we have some sort of yaqeen, even a little bit of yaqeen and full yaqeen, whatever, start the action, do tawassul with the imam, and you benefit. And tawassul with the imam, especially during one's youth, is extremely, extremely productive, especially, extremely, extremely uh, essential in one's journey towards the imam. The imam's attention comes on to you. And the, one of the best times for tawassul, our ulama say, is the time of sahab, just before Salat al-Fajr. When you sit, and there are different forms of tawassul. Many people think that tawassul is just by tawassul, but that's not the case. That is one form of tawassul. Doing, reciting Quran and doing hadiyah to the Imam of our time is also another form of tawassul. Reciting ziyarat, ziyarat al yasin, reciting uh, yasin itself, ziyarat al yasin, and then you know remembering the Imam, reciting at the speed of salawat and give, dedicating it towards the Imam. They're all forms of tawassul. Alfred Mispah used to emphasize this a lot, uh, reciting a whole, uh, whole tasbih and heading uh, and dedicating it towards the Imam of Ta'ala. These, these acts are forms of tawassul. From tawassul, you get to tawajjuh, where your attention to increases towards the Imam. You understand what the Imam expects of you. In Dua Ahad, this is, uh, I, didn't make, I didn't mention this in my points, but this is extremely, I just remembered now, and I was thinking about this this morning as well. In Dua Ahad, we have an extremely important Allah Mujahidin line where we say, Allah Mujahidin min awan wa ansari wa dha bin a'an wa al-musari'ina alayhi fi qadai hawa'ati wa al-mumtathinina li awamirih wa al-muhamina an. And then we say, Oh Allah, include me wa sabiqina ila iradati. Make me the most foremost in fulfilling the irada of the Imam. This is extremely important in understanding that we're not saying wa sabiqina ila qawli. Make me the most foremost in, uh, in you know, carrying out his word. Irada comes before word. The irada of an individual comes before what comes on his tongue. Now, you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make me amongst those individuals who are fulfilling the irada of the imam. Meaning, before the imam even speaks, you understand what the imam expects from you. Do we have such a level now? We don't have such a level now. We don't even know what the imam expects of us. How can we reach the stage an individual themselves know? Tawassul, tawajjuh towards the imam, the imam's tawajjuh towards you increases, and then slowly, slowly, your maqam of wilaya also increases. So that was the five levels of, um, in the, on the individual level, that's, the first was not to upset the imam, the second was to raise your level of tawheed, the third was to increase your knowledge, to discuss in suri and ilm al number four is to adopt correct role models, and in that as well, don't restrain this to yourself. When you, for example, read a particular good book, or a particular good article on a particular individual, and you say that this individual can be a role model, the likes of Imam Khomeini, or Shahid Ibrahim Hadi, or Shahid Muhsin Hujaji, don't restrain them, don't constrain them to yourself. Take this book and distribute it. Give it to five other people. Give it to 10 other people. Give it to one other person. Introduce these individuals in your society. And hence, you see how the society improves. And the number five was tawajju and tawassul towards the Imam. The Arz Ali Yaseen reciting the Quran and giving it as a gift, gifting it towards the Imam. Um, and tawassul towards the Imam is extremely, extremely important. What happens when we say that people say recite the Quran and gift it towards the Imam? 
we think that there has to be a long a long chapter of the Quran. It's not the case. You can give just five ayat, one page of the Quran, literally one minute, two minutes, gifted towards the Imam. What Shaitan does first, he prevents us from doing the particular good action itself. And then when we ourselves convince ourselves to do that particular good action, he tries to remove the spirit from that good action. He says, oh, what's, what's the point? He tries to take your attention away. So, can, you know, convince yourself to do that particular good action and then uh, maintain the spirit of that particular action and then give the reward towards the Imam. Now we can quickly, I'm trying to finish this in about five minutes. Um, on the social level, there are three things that I really wanted to say, uh, which I find are particularly important in terms of traveling towards the Imam on a social level that we need to understand. The first thing is that the direction of the community needs to be chosen and a plan needs to be made. We can't, what we did many, many years ago, we shifted or migrated to different parts of the world, we established a mosque, and then the point was just to build and, you know, carry out Thursday night programs and, you know, Friday Juma uh, khutbah and things like that. And, you know, slowly, slowly, that's how we thought we were going to sustain ourselves. We didn't realize there's a particular goal. Then the goal needs to be chosen, chosen, which is the reappearance of the Imam. The leaders of the community need to create a plan and each member of the community needs to know from the oldest to the youngest, what direction we're going in. You pick, you pick a particular old person or you pick a particular young person. Ask them what's, what direction is the community going each one should say that we are preparing for the reappearance of the Imam. This is extremely important. You ask a particular old person what direction, he says, what direction, what, what direction are you talking about? We don't know what direction we're going in. The, the child is completely lost, the youth is completely lost. The plan needs to be made. We need to openly announce that we're moving towards the Imam of our time. And through that plan, it needs to be, it needs to be you know, uh, evaluated each year, each five years, see how close we've gotten to the Imam of our time. Each community needs to have a path. Uh, you know, every uh, member of the community needs to know what direction the community is heading in. This niya needs to be announced announced openly. We need to say that we're moving towards the Imam of our time. It needs to be repeated so many times that every single person knows that. And the leaders of this is this is a point for the leaders of the community, the subcommittees of different communities. They need to create this plan and say that we're moving towards the Imam of our time. Enough is enough. We've gone out of this introduction phase of you know, the community, now is the growth phase. Now is actual action. Now is actually moving forward. So when will we allow the imam to be absent? The imam is waiting for us. He's more awaiting us than we were awaiting him. You know, he, he just looks at individuals and he says, when was the last? Let me check when this person remembered me last. And he looks and he says, oh, two weeks ago, he remembered me. Uh, what about this particular person? Let me check. When did he last remember me? Oh, today he remembered me. How long did you remember? Oh, for only one minute or 30 seconds. And then the Imam just becomes upset. What's the point? We need to have a strong irada of actually moving forward towards the Imam on an individual level and on a social level. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not change the state of a nation until they themselves change what is within their own souls. Number two, that was the first. The direction of the community needs to be chosen. chosen. The second thing is brotherhood and unity. It's extremely, extremely important. The Imam, in his letter to Sheikh Mufid, he says, The Imam says, May Allah, if only our Shia were united on that pledge which is on them, which pledged the pledge of Bilaya. If only our Shia were united on that pledge which is on them, and their hearts were united, and they were united on the, in their hearts, not just on their tongues, in their hearts. There would have been no delay in them being able to meet us. What does the Imam specify as being a barrier and an obstacle to meet the Imam? Disunity. We're not unified in our hearts. Each individual in the community should be at a stage where he's ready to sacrifice his own life for this particular brother or sister. Extremely important. We overlook this so many times. Brotherhood and unity. If they had this unity, they would have had the happiness of being able to meet us and meeting us with the true ma'arifah. 
And the only thing that is keeping this distance in between us and them, the Imam says, are these sins that they've committed. And we're extremely, these sins which have upset us extremely. The Imam says, we're aware of these sins. We're understanding what's going on. We're seeing what's going on. But this is the only thing that is keeping this distance in between us and them. In another hadith, uh, the Imam says, I can't remember which Imam this is, but he says that any person who is not able to give something to us, he can't reach us, for example, um, they're living far away. They can't reach us and they can't offer a gift to us. They wanted to give, give a gift to us, but they can't give a gift to us. What should they do? The Imam says that they should give a gift to one of our followers, one of our Shia. It's as if they've given a gift to us. Unity, brotherhood, creating this love between the brothers uh, and, and the unity between the community. This is extremely, extremely important. Where you have a unified community who stands in one line and they all have the same, same, all have the same mottos, all have the same goal, which is the imam of their time. This is the only thing which, you know, is the main obstacle between us and the imam of time. And finally, the last thing is, the last thing is understanding what is going on in the world. Atul Bashir used to say that there are many individuals who are waiting for the Imam because of their own personal desires. They think that the Imam will come and they will and he will fulfill this and this and this particular personal desire of theirs. These individuals are not waiting for the Imam, they're waiting for their own personal desires. The only individuals who are actually truly waiting for the Imam are those individuals who are waiting for this divine government of justice that the Imam will establish. And how can you, this divine government of justice and fairness, and how can you understand justice and fairness when you haven't identified the causes of oppression in this world? You need to understand what's going on in this world. Who are the sources and the causes of oppression that the Imam will fight against? Who are the Yazids, the Mu'awiyahs of today that the Imam will rise up against? We don't, we're unaware. We're meeting hands and we're shaking hands and we're you know, being in the same parties as those individuals who the Imam himself will rise up against. Because the person comes to Imam Ali salam, in the Battle of Jamal, he says, on this side, I can see you, Imam Ali salam, and on that side, I can see the wife of the Prophet and other individuals. I don't know where to go. The Imam says that you've identified truth, meaning us, you've identified truth and a truth and its people, but you haven't identified falsehood and its people. This is the main problem that you have. We need to identify falsehood. Again, may the same thing not happen that happened for, for, with those individuals. They couldn't choose the side because they didn't know who was on the fault. They hadn't identified falsehood. We need to identify falsehood and understand what's going on in this world. And, you know, that, that, that's, that's all that I had to say in terms of the individual and the social levels. And again, I'll just recap. Uh, on the social level, the first thing is that the direction of the community needs to be chosen and a plan needs to be made. Number two is brotherhood and unity for the sake of the Imam. And number three is understanding what's going on in the world. And slowly, slowly, these goals should not be that you work on it one week and you're gone after the, after the next. Or you come back onto it after a few weeks or four weeks or three months or four months. It doesn't work. It has to be continuous. It has to be continuous progress. And slowly, slowly, with effort, with struggle and sincerity, you get closer to the Imam of your time.